Hello, friends. This is Pastor J.D. Lee from Harvest Baptist Church of Allen, Texas. We're about to take you to one of the messages from the pulpit at Harvest Baptist Church, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. Pray that you'll enjoy this song just before the preaching, and may God richly bless you. Thank you for listening. disgusting stuff and uh, it's just the way it is amen that's why God had to judge them uh, but in Genesis 19 I want to pick up reading in verse number 15 and uh, we finished all the way through verse 14 last Sunday so we'll pick up in verse 15 today 
Bible says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here. That's four people. That's it. Four people. Uh, out of all that's there, only four people is going to escape. Anyways, he said, uh, Lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of this city. While he lingered, uh, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Well, there's a lot that I really am going to try not to get bogged down with here. But Verse 20 says, Behold, now... This city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? My soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of that city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and the, all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning. Lord, there's so much here, and uh, I know that we could probably divide this into three or four messages, but God, I believe you've given me the, the direction and the desire that you have for us this morning to get this simple thought, this simple truth out of this message. I pray you speak to the hearts of everyone that is here. And I pray, dear God, you speak to those that are going to be uh, listening by way of the internet later on at another time. I pray you bless this uh, service, bless the preaching to come in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, we're in our series here on Sunday morning called Going Forward from the Beginning. And uh, we are in message number 37 out of the book of Genesis in just uh, really uh, 18 and a half, 19 chapters. And so we're here this morning. Well, I thought about a couple different ways to title the message this morning. And the thought, the, the title that I'm not going to use, but I could use, is, is you could title this. Uh, uh, you could title this, The Beginning of Judgment That Brought Damnation and Deliverance. There's a judgment before us that did bring damnation, but it also brought deliverance. And you'll see that in the text. And so that is one way you can look at that. The, the message that, that I really believe the Lord had me uh, to use, and I hope this will make sense to us. If you'll stay, stay tuned, I think you'll get it. But the title of the message is Going Forward from the Beginning, The Beginning of a Merciful Judgment. The beginning of a merciful judgment. That almost sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds like a double, a contradictory statement. How can you have mercy and judgment in the same sentence? Hey Amen. Well, you really can't unless you're dealing with the Holy God. Right, Amen. Right. Like a God that is a God of judgment and a God uh, that is a God of mercy. I mean, He is the same. He's not one or the other. He is the same. And we know that God has not changed His mind about sin. God hates sin. We need to understand that. 
And uh, just by way of introduction, let me remind you that Calvary, Calvary, the cross on Mount Calvary was a picture of this exact same thing. It was the ultimate judgment of God against sin, all sin, mm -hmm. the sins of all mankind. We know that to be the case. That's why the Bible says in Romans 5 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, uh, Christ died for us. We know that Calvary is the picture of the worst damnation known to man. It is the absolute damnation that separates a man between God and men. In other words, without embracing Calvary, without embracing the cross, uh, without the embracing of Christ's blood, uh, you and I are damned for all of eternity to be in hell. Say amen right amen. there. That's the picture of the worst damnation, the worst judgment ever known to man. But in the midst of that beautiful judgment, uh, or should I say that awful judgment, it is a picture of beautiful, amen, mercy. Uh, mercy there on Calvary. We know that uh, justice demanded judgment. Amen. Oh, but listen, mercy brings justification. I, I'm telling you. And so you say, well, why in the world do you preach that? Because it's here. This is a picture of the beginning. I mean, maybe the first mention. Now, I know that we dealt with Noah and the ark. Amen. But you understand that in that was a different type of judgment. In fact, that damnation was it damned the entire humanity. It damned all of the world. Everything that ever existed was absolutely destroyed by the flood. We understand that. The whole world was saved by who? Eight souls God Amen. chose. I mean, there was no real deliverance in that judgment. God told them there was judgment coming ahead of time. They had a chance to prepare for that judgment. Are you listening? Amen. And they had a chance to repent. That was one. We've already dealt with all that. But here we find quite a different picture of God's judgment. We find here the beginning of a merciful judgment. The merciful judgment of God. Now we've read prior here uh, in the first 18, 19 uh, chapters, uh, really in the first, uh, the, the previous chapter and a half or so, and then primarily the first 18, 19 uh, verses, and then it went back up a little bit. And we get why there is judgment here. There is judgment upon the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. And we see that here. It's awful. It's absolutely tragic. Uh, but we have to remember, if you go back a chapter and a half or so where we preached a few weeks ago, the beginning of intercessory prayer. Remember Abraham, he prayed and he besought God, a man on this very wise. Uh, Abraham was not praying for deliverance for the city. Do you understand that? He was not praying that, that God would spare Sodom and Gomorrah at all. In fact, he knew they needed to be judged. Amen? He knew that judgment is sure to fall upon sin. Because you know why? Abraham knew God. Amen? The Bible's clear about that. All through the Bible, Old Testament and New, you know the Bible says of Abraham that Abraham believed God Amen. And it was imputed to him for righteousness. Amen. He lived by faith, right? Abraham was called what? The friend of God. Amen. Right. And so we remember when these two angels were primarily, I believe, the angel of the Lord, I believe was a pre-incarnate Christ. Amen. And we, we talked about that there. But remember he said, Shall I hide that which I do from Abraham? You remember that? I'm just giving you some review there. So there was judgment, amen, uh, on the horizon because of the wickedness of their sin. And I think it was just a little while ago we preached uh, two Sundays ago on the beginning of blind ambition. How remember the angels, they smoked those sodomites with blindness so that they wearied themselves to find the door. In other words, they were not even interested in changing their mind. There was nothing to stop them. Hey, this is be a crowd, listen to me now, that you can honestly say uh, by all counts of the Scripture and discernment, that they had been given over to a reprobate mind. How do you know? They never changed their mind. They, there was no repentance. There was no remorse. Therefore, judgment was sure to fall. Y'all with me? Yeah. And so we see here this morning the beginning of a merciful judgment. Now we saw some things through the text as we read. 
and there's a lot here. But we know that the Bible made it very clear the very next morning. Now, the night before, we talked about how that um, the, 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 uh, the beginning of lost influence. Remember when you lose your influence? Uh, and we talked about how did Lot get to the place where he lost his influence? Well, remember, it started, I, I've got to rehearse this because it fits right into the text. I, it's the same text, but remember, it started with Lot when he looked, and then he lifted up his eyes. Amen. It's all the well watered place. He looked towards sin. It always starts with a look, friend. When you start looking, amen, uh, away from God's Word, away from the protection and provision of God, you start looking to yourself to find out how you can uh, uh, find your own way to make things happen. And I'll deal with that probably more next week on the danger of taking things into your own hands and how the sin leads to other sin and all that. But it started with a look. Remember, he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah. He looked over there and then he, uh, he, started, he started leaning. Remember, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. So he looked that way. Maybe it wouldn't be nothing necessarily wrong with a glance or a look. But when you take that second look, you'll start leaning that way. And he leaned that way. It wasn't long. Listen, he began to live around it. And then, of course, we've got to the place where he lingered around sin. Remember that? Amen. That lingo? And here's why we use that word. Because it says, uh, remember, all that happened the night before. Y'all with me? And so all that happened. Uh, and then in verse 13, uh, the, you know, they told him, we will destroy this place, uh, amen, because the cry, amen, has come before the Lord. And so they let him know they're about to destroy uh, the place. That was his only sign of warning. And Lot went to, to talk, amen, to his family. The only family that he had there, his sons-in-laws and his daughters. And he said, hey, God's about to judge this place. But he seemed to one. He seemed to them as one that mocked. Amen. And you remember that? That was the night before. Alright? Mm -hmm. That was all. And we preached all that last week. Amen. That was the night before. It says that they seemed. Uh, he seemed as one that mocked. Now, that was the night before. So apparently, he goes and he tries to warn his family. That, now, he doesn't know when. You don't read anywhere that they said we are. They just told him in verse 13, uh, we will destroy this place because the cry of them, amen, is waxed great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So he goes out with that message. They didn't receive it. Now, he comes back apparently and he goes to bed or whatever the case is. I don't know how he slept that night. If he really believed that damnation is about to fall, he probably was troubled. I don't know. We don't have any account here of that. All we know is the night before, he went, and because he lost his influence, here's what's going to unfold. It says in verse 15 where we started, it says, what does it say? And when the morning arose. So here it is, early in the morning. Early in the morning. It says when the morning arose. That'd be, that'd be uh, sunrise. Amen. Early dawn that morning. It said when the morning arose. Amen. Then the angels hastened. They got him up. Amen. They said, listen, arise. They've already given him a chance to pull everybody out. Did y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. Because he said uh, in verse 12, Hast thou here any besides? Amen. Mm -hmm. Son of law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast. So they already knew. Remember, these, these are angels from God. They already knew who was there. Because God would not allow them to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there was any righteous people there. And right. so they already dealt with that. They said, get them out. They wouldn't do it. So the very next thing he says, now they're not even worried about that. They've rejected. They had an opportunity to, I mean, to repent, to, to, to turn, amen, from Sodom and Gomorrah. There's so much there. I'm not even dealing with it. I'm taking that you know your Bible. But here we go. He said, take thy wife and thy two daughters. Now, they don't say anything about the sons-in-laws and the daughters because right. they've already condemned their soul. They have already sealed their fate. Are you listening? Lot's family is already damned uh, to condemnation under God's wrath because they had an opportunity and they would not receive it. And it's Lot's fault because he lost his influence. Now, we dealt with that. But here they go. He said, get them out. He said, that, and they wouldn't listen because <laughs> he said, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So there's the warning. Life's still not moving real fast. Mm -hmm. Here's my point. Look at verse number 16. 
And while he watched that word, look at your Bible and tell me what is that word? While he what? Linger. There it is, church. What I told you last week. He's lingering around sin. Now the angels have already told him they're going to destroy the place. He already went out and tried to make a difference that didn't. Now it's time for destruction to fall. And he's still not moving with haste. The angels are hasting. And it says he lingered still. He's dragging his feet. That's the danger of what happens when you get around it. You think you're so spiritual. I'm going to tell you something. You will drag your feet because you're going to come up with every sentimental excuse why you don't want to leave uh, that which you're comfortable with. But nonetheless, I ain't got time for all this. But it says, while he lingered, notice what they did. The men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. Mm. The Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and said, they carried their tail out of them. I just say before I preach, it would be a shame if God had to carry you away from a place because you're lingering around in a place God don't want you. It doesn't have to be sinful. Now this account is. I'm just going to make a little delicate application and run through here. The place where you're at in your life doesn't have to be sinful. If God begins to tell you to get away from that place or to move on to the next place or whatever it is and you linger around, I'm going to tell you what God will do. Amen. He may leave you there and let you destroy your life or He may just carry you out. And you don't want God to have to carry you away. Because there will be, there'll be an absolute mess. Amen. I'm just telling you, I've experienced some of both of those things in my life. But here's what I want to preach. The beginning of a merciful judgment. Here's how it unfolds. This is an awful judgment. You understand that. I, I know you know your Bible well enough to know this is not a pleasant thing. Judgment is not a good thing. You know, and by the way, just a little note, uh, in the New Testament, the Bible says, and we know the time has come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. At the house of God. And God is giving us a chance under grace to judge ourselves so that He doesn't have to come and destroy us. I mean, that's a fact. And Amen. you go read that in Peter. I think it's Peter. He deals with all that. And they ain't help. Here it is. I'm going to give you the outline. Y'all, don't, don't be too tired and sleepy this morning. Get a hold of this. It will help us. Amen. The beginning of a merciful judgment. This awful judgment, number one, let me tell you a few things about it. It was determined by sovereignty. The judgment here was already determined by a sovereign God. The sovereignty of God determines that sin will always be judged. Hey, that's why you can't get by with your sin. You might think you're getting by. Maybe it's a sinful attitude or a sinful mindset about anything in life. It can Listen, it can be about your finances. It can be about your family. It can be about your friendships. It can be about your career. It can be about your education. It can be, you just name it. It can be about anything you want to name. But anything that you and I do, listen, that is contrary to God's Word, it is sin. Sin is a transgression of the law, according to the New Testament in 1 John. Right? Amen. Sin is a transgression of the law. Y'all with me? To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is what? Sin. Amen. Understanding that sin is sin, do you understand that God's sovereignty has already declared damnation upon sin? Do we understand that? Amen. In other words, you're not going to get by. Judgment is going to come upon that which is sin. Y'all with me? Amen. So it's determined by sovereignty. Verse 13, look at it. It says in verse 13, we will. It doesn't say we might. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about it. There's a possibility. No, it says we will. You know what that is? That's an absolute. But it goes mm -hmm. further. There's the authority. Verse 13 says, we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. But here, but that's not even the real reason. The reason is, I mean, that's the reason, but here's where they get to the authority. And the Lord hath sent us for one purpose. God sent them there not to, listen, the, the, the opportunity for repentance has already passed. The opportunity for grace has already passed here because God sent them there to destroy it. Amen. Right. Now, God was going to extend mercy to Lot's family. We saw that. And He told them, the angels told them, get them out. Amen. Go give them an opportunity. And what did He do? He went to them. He pleaded with them one last time, if you will. 
And I understand this is Old Testament, but there's a lot of principles here. He pleaded with them, but they would not have none of it. So therefore, it's already a sealed deal. We're already going to judge. Now, God may have extended some mercy to His family had they repented. They should have known the truth, but they did not. And therefore, the judgment of God upon this awful place, this awful judgment, it was determined already by sovereignty. God sovereignly determined judgment upon sin. And I'm going to tell you something, you're not above that. If you Amen. think for a minute that your sin, just because you're getting by with it now, today, or whatever the case is, maybe you've gotten by with it your entire life, and you want to plead ignorance or stupidity, however it is. A lot of people do that. Well, I've done this my whole life. I don't know better. Well, that's fine if you think that's going to work. But I want you to understand, you might get by with that for a lifetime, but don't think for a minute God's not going to judge it. Amen? Judgment comes in different fashions. I don't have time to deal with all of that, but it was determined by sovereignty. You go back to chapter 18 and verse 20 and 21. Listen to this. This is the first appearance, amen, on the matter of the judgment that's about to fall. And the Lord said, He said to Abraham, remember in the heat of the day they were in the tent? He said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, amen, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. God is going to know about your sin. You might as well remember, be sure your sin will find you out. You say, nobody knows. God knows. Amen. And He's going to inquire. He's going to check things out. You say, yeah. I don't believe that. Well, you don't believe the Bible then because God said because their sin is great. Amen. It's mm -hmm. awful. And God has determined to judge sin. Amen. And so we know it's determined by sovereignty. You know Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 and 8. You can quote it. Be not deceived. In other words, don't think you're going to get by with your sin forever. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Do you realize if God does not judge, amen, and sovereignty does not determine judgment upon sin, that's a mockery of who God is. Amen. That's what he's saying. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You think you're getting by with your sin. That is a mockery. You're trying to mock God by acting as if your sin don't stink. Hey, man, you know why people do that? They look at so-and-so across the road and say, well, brother, so-and-so is this way. And I mean, they seem to be getting by. You know what yeah. happens? We begin to compare ourselves among right. ourselves. I, I, and I'm running some parallels here. But I'm telling you, that's when people in their mind begin to say, well, my sin's not as bad. I'm not a drunk. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not fornicating. I'm not watching pornography. I'm not drinking alcohol. Right. I'm not smoking or dipping tobacco. I'm not scratching lottery tickets. I'm not gambling. I'm not doing that. Yeah, but do you dress right? Do you live right? Do you have the right attitude? Hey, listen to me. You can have everything right and still have the wrong attitude about it. Amen? I'm just simply telling you that sin is a mockery of God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Why? For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And then he goes further and says, For he that soweth to his flesh. Hold on just a second. We're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, they've been doing so into their flesh. Amen. What pleases the flesh? Why are they in such gross sin? Because it's what their flesh wanted. That's why they wearied mm -hmm. themselves to find the door. But he that sow it to the flesh, watch this now, shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. Yes. But he that sow it to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Be not deceived. I'm talking about judgment is determined by a sovereign God against sin. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 9, verse 17, listen to this. The wicked shall be turned into hell. Amen. And not only that, it says, in all nations I have forget God. Excuse me for saying, we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, the judgment that was determined by sovereignty. God said, the wicked, a man shall be turned into hell, and all nations, excuse me, Sodom and Gomorrah, what they do? They forgot God. How do you know? Because they knew God. They knew about God. Don't say they didn't know God. They yeah. just, uh, hey, you can go to Romans and you can go back and say they retained not God in their knowledge. Right. They glorified Him not as God over and over through the Scripture. It's clear they forgot God. They're wicked and guess what? They're now about to be turned into hell. Amen? That's what fire and brimstone comes down, consumes them. Why did this awful judgment take place? Number one, because it was determined by sovereignty. You cannot escape the judgment of sin. 
If you think that you can escape the judgment of sin, you might as well say that Calvary was not necessary. Because Hebrews talks about those, amen, that would put an open shame to Jesus. In other words, they trample under their feet the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he said. Right. Why? Because they think that it wasn't necessary. In other words, when you treat grace like a license to sin, well, I'm saved. I can get forgiven. That's what that kind of attitude is. Come on now. Okay. You don't have me to have to preach a whole hour on that. But when you treat grace like a license to sin, in other words, I'm saved. I can get forgiveness. No, what you're doing is you're making His cross of none effect. In other words, that doesn't really have to be the ultimate judgment of sin. Excuse me, Calvary is an open declare, declaration of God's detesting and damnation against sin. Absolutely. Amen. Why did Calvary take place? You know why Calvary took place? Because without Jesus Christ being our perfect Lamb, without Jesus Christ being the interceder, without Jesus Christ, hey, being our substitutionary propitiation, do you know who's supposed to be on the cross? Me. You are. In me. Without Jesus, you have a cross to bear. You know why? Because God hates sin. Right. He hates your sin. He hates my sin. And without Jesus being willing to step into that place as a substitutionary death, say amen right there, amen. then you have to hang on the cross because you're damned to hell. You are condemned. Amen. And I'm telling you, God has already determined. He's declared that His sovereignty will judge sin. That was in, this is in the Old Testament. Excuse me, where are we at? We're in Genesis. Why? The judgment against sin was before the foundation of the world. What are you talking about? God already knew. Wait, let's go back to the Garden of Eden for a minute. Excuse me. Why did man try to cover up his sin? Uh, and God said that won't work. Why? Remember Adam and Eve? They made themselves aprons of fig leaves and they were still naked in the sight of God. And God did what? He shed blood. Right. Why? Because the sin's already been determined of God to be judged. Are y'all are with me? Mm -hmm. The beginning said, hey, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission. But that shedding of blood is a picture of the one thing that happens in judgment, and that is mercy. It can happen. God desires to... I'm trying to get you to get that message that God desires to extend mercy even in judgment because you're not going to escape judgment. That is the point. No. You cannot escape the judgment of sin, and neither can I. Amen. The only thing we can do is plead the mercy of Jesus Christ, amen, instead of our sin. And I'll show you that as we go through. So this awful judgment, number one, was determined by sovereignty. Not only that, the awful judgment of sin that we see here in this chapter, not only was it determined by sovereignty, but number two, it was the destruction of Sodom. It was the very destruction of this place. Amen. Look at verse 24. Verse 24 says this. I'm going to walk through some verses. We've already read them. I'm just hitting the highlights here. Verse 24 said, uh, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah. He rained uh, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. You know how God feels about sin? I'm talking about He'll send down fire from heaven to burn yeah. it up. Amen. You ever read about God sending down fire from heaven? It's never a good thing. Yeah. When God sends down fire from heaven, people die. People get consumed. Amen. Yeah. Remember, uh, Matt, uh, hey, come on now. Do you remember Elijah on Mount Carmel? Amen. And God let him bring down fire from heaven and it, it consumed uh, all of the altar, the sacrifice. And then after that, they shed the blood of every false prophet of Baal. Over 450 prophets of Baal plus 400 grove, uh, prophets of the grove of Jezebel. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. That ain't the first time though. Do you remember when the man of God, Elijah was up in the mountain praying and they kept running up to him and he called down fire from heaven and consumed the first group and he consumed the second group and the third group said, hold on, time out, time out. They didn't want to get fried like sausages because they knew that was the ultimate judgment of God upon sin. Come on. That's Amen. exactly right. And over and over. Now, let's fast forward. Remember the New Testament? Remember the disciples? They were a little unhappy about these guys that weren't living like true disciples. Remember that? And they said, God, they said, Jesus, shall we call down fire from heaven and consume them? And the Lord said, hey, hey, hey. He rebuked them. He said, you don't know what's... <laughs> you don't know what you're asking because that's a picture of the judgment of God. You don't want God to rain down right. fire. Excuse me. In the, in the Remember when, 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 the, when the tribulation takes place? Now there's going to be two prophets, amen, two witnesses. And what are they going to do? They're going to... There's going to be a fire come out of their mouth and a sword that devours those that are contrary to God. What are you saying? I'm just telling you, when the fire of God falls from heaven, it's always, amen, amen, a picture of the judgment of God upon sin. Amen. Ha. He said, he said, 
said he rained down. Man, that's a terrible, that's a terrible thing. Hey, Amen. Man. Okay, you want another example? Remember what happened in Egypt? Remember the plagues? Yeah, there was right. a time when God rained down hell, hellfire, amen, right. from heaven, and He burned up Egypt. Remember that? That was right. part of the plagues. You remember that? <laughs> I'm telling you something. It's not good. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And listen, you think a hailstorm in Texas is bad. And I've had to replace a windshield or two because of a hailstorm, and that was just little balls of ice. Can you imagine a hailstorm from heaven was the hell is not ice but fire. I'm talking about God. Oh, I wish I had time to preach a whole message on the fire of God. How that it purges, amen. It purifies. It burns up and judges that that needs to be judged, amen. By the way, why do you think the ultimate judgment? What is the ultimate judgment? It's the lake of what? The lake of fire. God hates sin. And so because of that, He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. Verse 24. Verse 26 says, uh, and the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within... I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong chapter. Verse 26 of chapter number 19, the Bible says this, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became uh, a pillar of salt. Amen. It destroyed her. Verse 29, it says this, And it came to pass when God... What's the next word? Destroyed the cities of the plain. Uh, I'm telling you, the last part of that verse, well, let's read the whole verse. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow which he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this awful judgment of God was determined by sovereignty, number one. But number two, it was the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. To this day, there is no Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you understand? Right. In the New Testament, Jesus, hey, is preaching and teaching, and he said, Woe unto you, Corinth, and if the, the mighty works that have been done here had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, that's what Jesus said, mm -hmm. they would have repented. But you didn't. Woe unto you. That's dangerous ground. He said, because of that, you're in dangerous ground with God. God's done mighty works. He's extended grace. And you have had none of it. Because of their unbelief, He did not many mighty works there. But Jesus Himself, He condemned Chorazan in those places. Why? Because they had more opportunity to repent than Sodom and Gomorrah did. Amen. That's what He said. If they had seen what you've seen, they would have repented. That's what Jesus said. I'm talking about New Testament, friend. So what are you saying? I'm saying this judgment, this destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is all the way through the Bible still being referenced to because there's no judgment ever been on such a destructive way like this. Amen. That's why you've heard preachers the wrong. Let me just say this right now, especially if somebody's listening out there and trying to trap uh -huh. me in my words. They are wrong. Every preacher that's ever said this is wrong. So I'm going to make sure we're real clear. I've heard it my whole life. It's wrong. It's contrary to the Bible. But I want you to understand what you've probably heard. I've heard preachers my whole life say, if God don't judge America, was, what, have you ever heard the rest of that sentence? What do they say? He'll have to apologize to Sodom. You ever heard that? Yeah, sure. We've heard that our whole life. God don't judge America. He'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Excuse me. God don't have to apologize for nothing. That's why they're wrong. But I understand what they mean. That's not a good true statement. It's not a it's not a good statement at all. Not saying that God made a mistake. No, God didn't make a mistake. That's just you think America's wicked. I'm gonna tell you how wicked America is. She's wicked, but she ain't near as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, if you think about that, let that digest a minute. As wicked as America is, has God ever rained down fire and brimstone? No. That don't mean he won't. They hadn't done it yet. You know what that tells me? We haven't even hit the threshold of how wicked they were. See, don't be so ignorant like a lot of people in this generation that don't know the Bible. And I've heard this too. We've never seen it so bad. Fooey on you. We've never seen it so bad. You better read your Bible, friend. It was so bad. Have you ever read about the judges, the times of judges, the awful things that were taking place there and all of that? And we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, a place of sexual immorality. That was their worst sin. But you know how they got to that place? Because of wealth. Mm-hmm. And comfort. That's right. Because they, oh, God help me to not go off this morning in the flesh. You know why they got to that place? You want me to tell you why I preach so hard against finances the way I do? Because it was their financial ruin that brought them to that place. It was their finances. Go read your Bible, friend. It was because of their finances that got them in the place of <coughs> sinful ways to where God had to rain down fire and judge. I'm talking about it, was, it, was it destroyed them. 
It absolutely destroyed them. Everybody, can you imagine? Man, wrap your, I don't want to get hung up here. But can you imagine having a little child? Let's just say, Cassidy's going to be nine in a couple of weeks. But let's just say she's four. Let's just go, she's four. She's the closest one to four in here. I didn't say you're the closest one to act like four, but you're the, anyway, you're the closest one to four. She's four. Let's say she's four years old. And God forbid, we're living in a city called Sodom and Gomorrah. She's four. She don't really have a whole lot of understanding, maybe. Maybe she's two. I don't care how old she is. Let's just say she's two to four years old, just a little child. She doesn't understand the fullness of the wickedness of this city. Right. But because of their sinful ways, the destruction of that place also meant not only the destruction of daddy and mama, but it meant the destruction of the children too. None of them are left. None of them. None of them. Why? God doesn't. So let's say you're two years old and you don't know the difference between right and wrong, and God in His mercy lets you get killed because He knows that that's how he's, you're saved. You're not saved. If you're two years old, you're not saved yet because you don't have an understanding, but you're saved. And that means when God kills you because of their sin, you get to go to heaven and they're going to hell. Now that's a mouthful, but that's, go study your Bible, friend. I'm going to saw the ground. Amen. They're safe until, amen, the day of accountability when they can rightly discern between right and wrong. Say amen right amen. there. How old were you when you got saved, son? Four. So when you came four years old, you knew if you didn't accept Christ, you were going to die and go to hell. So yeah. you knew the difference between right and wrong, between yeah. sin and good, right? right? Therefore, you were accountable. See, I'm telling you right now, friend, absolutely destroyed. It destroyed not only the city mm -hmm. and everything that grew on the ground. It destroyed the parents, the grandparents. Oh my. It had killed you, so it had killed your mama too. Because she's part of that. And it had killed your daddy. So look at there. Three generations right there. It had killed your mom and dad. It had killed their parents. It had killed you and me. And it had killed her. Which means that's where it stops. There's nobody coming after you. Now that's a, that's a serious destruction, friends. Yeah, that's right. That's a destruction. Uh, why? Because of sin. Mm -hmm. What led to that gross sin? Huh, this is the thing that gets me, and I wish I had time. Over here somewhere, when God was blessing them for the intent that they would bless Him, they decided they don't need God. It's amazing how many people, when they're in trouble, all of a sudden they got to pray. When you pray, I'm in a mess. They need God real bad when they're in trouble, especially when they're in financial trouble. I need God. And they do, and they cry out. I've had, them, I've had them sitting all across this congregation and every congregation that I've ever preached at in the United States of America, and even down by Mexico, the same thing is true. When they're in trouble, they cry out to God. And all of a sudden, when God blesses them, well, I don't need church. I don't need to tithe off of that. That's not, and, and on and on. Finan I'm telling you, I'm, check it out. Started back here with financial problems. And then... All of a sudden, because they were at ease, their distorted view began to destroy. You tell me that God destroyed every generation that ever lived at the same time, all because of some sin right here that we think is not a big deal? Man, I'm telling you, you better understand the ways of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's sovereign, but it was the destruction. It was the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says, listen to this. The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse number 38, but the transgressors, hey, who's the transgressor here? Excuse me, was the child a transgressor? No. Mm -mm. No, but God's thorough in his purging. He right. said, The transgressors shall be destroyed together. Yeah. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. You, the end of the wicked. Now, I'm making a delicate application. So if I'm out of order, you just check it out and then you help me understand. But I, I, I think this is, I'm not saying that's all. I'm not being dogmatic. But I think I can make a little application. It says, the transgressors shall be destroyed together. All of those that were transgressing in the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, they all destroyed together. Right? But it says, but the end of the wicked. Is that right? Yeah. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. Excuse me for just a second. If, if, and your mom went to the restroom, but if she was sitting here, and, uh, and so I'm going to say that, because three ladies here, so, so, so let's say she's a transgressor, and you're a transgressor. Y'all are destroyed together, right? But this is the end of the line. There's nobody behind her. So the end of the wicked, that's the end of the line of wickedness. It's cut off. 
God cut it off where there won't be a propagation of the next generation of wickedness. Now, I believe that's a delicate application, but I believe that's right. Because what happens, why does God kill? Have you ever read where He said to, to the armies of God, go in and kill the women and the suckling, the babies, the infants? I used to struggle. I've told you all before. I used to really struggle with my Bible and my God. Why would God kill innocent? I'm, I'm telling you, it was a struggle. You remember those years? I struggled with that, Brother James. I struggled. How could God, a good God, a holy God, kill a bunch of innocent babies like that? And then I began to realize the mercy of God. Because what He's doing, He cut off the end of their wickedness so they can't go any further. There can't be another generation of wicked if you cut them off. Right, so where does He cut them off? He destroys all of that up to this point. I'm using her as the illustration. And I sit up for a minute so I can divide y'all. Alright, scoot over a little bit. You're cracking. Okay, there we go. You don't want to get destroyed with them. Amen. You're going to die, but God's going to deliver you in the destruction. Amen. In destruction, there's deliverance. That's what I'm preaching this morning about the beginning of a merciful judgment because we see the first picture of this right here. As He destroys those transgressors, He's cutting off the line of the wicked. He cut you off a man from wickedness so he could bring you into righteousness. Oh, Lord, God, I'm telling you. It's good. What a God we serve. He said this, the way of the Lord is straight to the upright. Amen. Amen. But destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. Proverbs 10, 29. I'm talking about this is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 through 9. You'll see another picture, amen, about destruction. So number one, this awful judgment was determined by sovereignty. Number two, it was the destruction of Sodom. But number three, I just want to hit this because it's here, it was displayed. I, Amen. In the smoke. Look at verse 28. Verse 28 says of chapter 19, look at this. It says in verse 28, uh, it said, and he looked, now back, let me back up to verse 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. I want to just hit this because it's here. I'm not looking for it, but it is in our context. Can I tell you what will help you not to fall into the destruction of God Almighty when He brings judgment? You better learn to get up early in the morning and have a place where you meet with God. That's important. It's right there. Do you think God just misses words? I mean, He put this in the Scripture. We don't need to blow past it. That's a powerful verse right there. I'm probably going to preach a whole message on that. But because of y'all, I didn't want to bore you with a whole message on prayer. But just to hit it in passing, it says He got up early in the morning and He went to the place where He met with the Lord. Do you understand? That's talking about a prayer life. That's talking about an altar of prayer. Why was Abraham not on that side of the judgment? I tell you why. Because he had a determination way before the judgment of God would ever fall. He had a determination back here. I'm going to meet with God. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to walk with God. That's what brought him to the place when the herdmen of Lot strove with the herdmen of Abraham and he told Abraham, hey, just let God, you know, God said, yeah, just give him uh, this. And Abraham went to Lot and he said, lift up your eyes. Take whatever side you want to take. I'll go the opposite way. We be brethren. There shouldn't be any strife. Are you listening to me? How did he make that decision? Because he had a place where he met with God, and when he got through making the decision, and Lot made the decision to go into sin, Abraham stayed with God, and God comes back by and says, Lift up your eye. Every place in the sole of your foot touches, I'm giving it to you. Why? Because you chose me over sin. Because you had early, you were early in the morning getting up and meeting with God when it wasn't required. Oh, yes, it's there. So because of that, look what happens though. This is amazing. Because it says, verse 27, Abraham got up early in the morning. You can change it all you want to, but you're not going to change the Scripture. You will never, I don't care if you like this or don't, you're never going to have the kind of prayer life you need to have until you learn to get up early in the morning and meet with God. You say, I work at night. I remember preaching a, a little bit up with Brother Joel Gray's uh, back when I was up there, and I made I got kind of hung up on that secret place for a little while, and Brother Gray got up before. Now I'm just telling you what it's public information. I don't know if they recorded it or not. He said this. I didn't know this. Well, I knew, but I didn't know. I wasn't aiming at nobody, and I'm not aiming at nobody now. But Brother Gray got up after the service, and people were testifying and weeping. God just moved in a special way. He made a statement. He said it's hard. He said, Church, I'm not going to make excuses. I'm going to confess. I'm going to repent right here in front of the whole church. 
we need, we need to be able to be willing to do that. He said, it's hard to get up early in the morning and have a prayer life when you already have to get up at four in the morning, amen, for your job. He said, and, and then you come at the end of the day and you're giving everything left over to God. You really don't have, he's just saying, I've struggled with that in my life. He said, but I'm determined, amen, to get up in the morning early so that I have that walk with God. He cleared off the spot and, and boy, let some other people to get real. What are you saying? I'm just telling you the principles in the Word of God. Go study it. But, but here's what happened. Because Abraham already had that, it wasn't new. Notice what it says. I'm talking about it was displayed in the smoke. The judgment of God is set on display. Who's going to see it? This is what I want you to see. Again, verse 27, Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And that sentence continues on in verse 28. Now here's the deal. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Before I read the rest of that, can I, can I make a little... Uh, 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 my mind just went blank. A suggestion. I mean, I, I, oh man, I'm gonna make a suggestion because it'll come to me in a minute. But I, my mind, I just lost my vocabulary there for a minute. What is the word I'm looking for? Anyhow, here's my suggestion. I thought information. I'm implying something here because I think the scripture is. Abraham got up early in the morning and he went to pray. We saw that, right? But isn't it interesting that right here in that first, that next verse, I think verse 27, it says, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Can I just throw a little possibility, a suggestion? Is it possible a couple chapters ago we talked about the beginning of intercessory prayer. That was the beginning of intercessory prayer. Could it be that he's still interceding? Because he knows. I don't know how much time passed from the time they left Abraham uh, to this. I mean, possibly from what we see on the surface, it could be three or four days. It could be. It could be. I don't know. Doesn't matter. But the point is this: Abraham's already been communicated with, and he communicated with God, and he interceded, and God said, "Okay, I'll spare for this." Remember all that. Yeah. And but yet here he comes early in the morning to stand before the Lord to pray, to have a time of prayer, and he's looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that implies that he's still praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. He's still praying for God to keep His Word. He's still praying for God to keep His promise. Amen. Why is he looking over there? Well, excuse me. Did God already tell him he was going to destroy them? He right. did. Now, I don't think that... I didn't read it anywhere. If y'all know another verse, you tell me after church. Amen. But I didn't read anywhere where he told him how he was going to destroy them. <laughs> did y'all? It ain't there. As far as I know, it ain't there, son. God never told him this is how I'm going to destroy them. But wait a minute. Abraham knew God. He believed God. It's what the Word of God says. So therefore, as he goes to pray, I'm just hitting this in passing. He's praying and he's looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. Maybe he's praying about that situation because he's still burdened for Lot. I'm just throwing that in there, okay? It's just a spec. That's the word. Thank you, Lord. Speculation. I'm speculating that that may be what's going on here. Why? Because I'm telling you, the judgment of God was determined by sovereignty. Listen, it was the destruction of Sodom. But I'm telling you, number three, it was displayed in the smoke. Because if you look at verse 28 again, it says he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, look what he saw this time. He's not seen that before. He said, behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. But verse 29, just look at it. It says, It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham. What did He remember? He remembered Abraham's prayer. Right. Yeah. That's how... Excuse me. That's I, You can say what you want. I want to preach the whole message on that. But I believe that's why God spared Lot. Because yeah. Lot... Listen, wait a minute. If, now, people say that there was no eternal salvation in the Old Testament. Well, whatever. They got saved the same way. They got saved by faith. Amen. They had to believe something ahead. Abraham was looking for a city, amen, whose builder was God, right or not. Amen. I, I mean, you say how far you want to go with that, it doesn't matter. There is a place called paradise. 
Paradise is in the heart of the earth, is it not? Is paradise not a separate compartment of hell? Yes. Let's say there's a great gold fix. That's what Abraham said. Well, paradise would have been a place where there was maybe maybe a, a, a blissful waiting of the Lord's deliverance, that eternal salvation, if you will. Mm-hmm. I'm not even trying to get into all this, but it's there. I know people get confused because they don't know how to study their Bible, and they try to say this. Well, Old Testament saints didn't have eternal salvation. Excuse me, uh, is Moses an Old Testament saint or not? Okay, so when Jesus went on the Mount on the Mount of Transfiguration, who was with him? Two Old Testament saints, mm-hmm. Moses and Elijah. How did they get there? If Jesus is eternal. Anyways, y'all with me? Mm-hmm. So anyhow, there's that that place called paradise. There's a place called hell. There's a great gulf fix between the two. But it says Jesus went down and he delivered captive. Amen. He had them free. What did he do? He took them into he took them into eternal. Uh, anyhow. So all that's there, what are you saying? I'm simply saying that obviously there is some salvation there and because Lot was a righteous man according to Hebrew, that, that even if God had let Lot get destroyed in the fire, that wouldn't have took his soul. That's what I'm trying to say. So what I'm saying is this, that our Lord was in no obligation to spare Lot from the destruction that came on everybody else. It just His eternal destination was different. See, are you all? It rains on the just and the unjust alike. Is that what the book says? So that means that you can be destroyed in the judgment of God. Because how many times have you read how God would allow wicked people to bring judgment upon His people, and He delivered them through that? And I'm getting way ahead of myself. But all I'm simply trying to tell you is that Abraham was praying for Lot, praying for Sodom and Gomorrah, and God remembered Abraham. What I'm trying to get you to understand, the judgment of God, though it was determined by sovereignty, amen, it was absolutely the destruction of Sodom. It was displayed in the smoke. The display of smoke. What about that? I'm just trying to pass through that verse. The display, who's it for? Do you think it was for the wicked? No. They lived it. They died because of that smoke. Yeah. You understand that? Right. They were consumed. They were destroyed because of the judgment of God. So it wasn't for them. Twofold. I believe that that display of smoke was for Abraham personally because the Bible says in the very next verse, God remembered Abraham. And Abraham saw the judgment of God fall. Did he not? A couple yeah. things about that. I'm not even, oh Lord, I'm getting way bogged down. Abraham, you don't need to pray anymore. It's over. Mm. There's a day coming. You can say what you want to say. If you know your Bible at all, you know this is solid ground. There is a day when God says, don't even, don't even waste your breath on me anymore. I've turned them over. Now, I, I'm not saying we know when that is. But there are times. There are times. There's people in my life God has told me, don't pray for them anymore. I can show you. I, I think I did one time on, maybe it was a Thursday night several years ago, I preached an entire message and ran through all the scriptures where God is teaching people the principle of not praying for people anymore. That's a dangerous place to be. That's a very dangerous place to be. But in this case, Abraham, you don't need to pray for him anymore. I've already done the destruction. The judgment has fallen. That's part of it. But, but here's the other thing. That smoke, I said the display of the smoke, you know what God just put on display? You know what He just put on display? He put His holiness on display. So I am a holy God. And that, amen. He's a holy God. He put. You know what else he put on display? Judgment. That God hates sin. And that smoke. I'll just say it like this: the smoke that went up. The Bible says it went up. Now there's a whole bunch about smoke going straight up. Amen. amen. When God. Uh, amen. When there's a sacrifice that it was pleasing to the Lord, the smoke went straight up. Is that what it says? Amen. Go read the law. Of, uh, go read all about uh, in the book of Leviticus and the law of the sacrifices and all that. If the smoke didn't go straight up, God refused it. Right. Is that right or not? Right. Now wait a minute. Who brought judgment? God, am I am I going too deep for y'all this morning? Come on now. Who brought judgment? God brought judgment. The Amen. sovereign brought Amen. judgment. Who's pleased with the judgment? God Almighty is. Because the Bible says the smoke went up like a furnace. Is that right or not? And by the way, those people, do you want to tell me that the people of Jewish descent, those Hebrews, you want to tell me they didn't know about smoke going straight in the air? You better believe they knew it. Amen. You better believe they knew some things about God. I know that God hadn't instituted the law yet and all that, but they, they, there were some things they knew. Amen. Who wrote the law? Moses. Moses wrote Genesis. Amen. Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So all I'm simply saying is that, that smoke going straight up, could it, did it ever occur to you that the smoke being on display was also for the benefit of those that were dabbling in sin that God would say, you're next. 
You keep playing in your mm -hmm. sin. You keep acting like you're getting by with it. They thought they would never have to answer. They thought they would never be judged. They kept on sinning. How do you know? They kept on sinning. They were blinded by their own ambition to sin. They wearied themselves over and over and over. We've already studied all that. And God says to the nations around that saw that smoke, Hey, you're next. Keep playing in your sin. I'm going to take you out too. I'm telling you, that display Amen. was probably a fearful thing to be honest with you. Excuse me, have you ever seen a, a little field on fire? In Dallas, Texas, it's pretty flat. It is flat out here. I hate it, but it's not as flat as Canada, so praise God for that. But you can get up on a high rise, on, 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 the, on, the, on the high five or anywhere else, and you can just, I, I go on the tollway and I can see as far as I can see. Hey, have you ever seen a fire burning, a, a little bitty, a little bitty mm -hmm. fire, and you see that smoke forever? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the amount of smoke that an entire, that two entire Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities? Yeah. Can you imagine the kind of smoke that went up? Excuse me, if you saw that, would that not strike fear in your heart? If you knew anything about God, it would. Yeah. Right. I'm just saying the display of the smoke. It was display. The judgment of God was on display. For everyone to see, Abraham got to see it. He probably the first one that saw it because he was up early. That's a whole other. You get up early, you get an advantage point of things of God. <laughs> Man, that's a whole other nugget. I'll throw that one at you for free. But that display says, hey, there is a God. Do you think people didn't know about the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah? I'm all I want you to think. Why would God do that? He displayed His judgment for others to see. And then I got to move on. Here's the last, last point. What's the title of the message, preacher? The beginning of a merciful judgment. We've looked in great detail about this judgment. This judgment's awful. It's awful. Amen. It was, but it was determined by sovereignty. We, don't let sovereignty scare you. We are not Calvinists. Hey, man, we believe in the sovereignty of God. He is a sovereign God. We just don't believe in sovereign grace. In other words, right. some are predestined to hell, some are predestined to heaven. That's a, that's, that, what that is is damnable heresy taking stuff out of context. God's sovereignty doesn't predetermine who goes to heaven or hell. It just means that He already knows who's going to accept and don't. If you want to get down to it. It was determined by sovereignty. Hey, man, it was the destruction of Sodom, but it was displayed in the smoke. That's the judgment that we're looking at here. But you said the beginning of the beginning of merciful judgment. Yes. And this is where I want to spend my time. This is the whole message this morning. I know it was determined by sovereignty. We know that it was the destruction of Sodom and it was displayed in the smoke. But lastly, I want to preach this thought for a little while. This judgment brought deliverance for some. It brought deliverance for some. I want, I want to hit these verses and just kind of recap. Verse 15 of our text, where we started. Verse 15 says, When the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot. Rise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity. You know what that is? That's mercy. Mm -hmm. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Excuse me, just a second. What's grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Amen. Amen. Grace is when you get something that you don't deserve. Mm -hmm. There's nobody in this room that deserves to be saved by grace. Mm -hmm. None of us. But grace, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What is grace? It's unmerited favor. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So grace is when we receive something we don't deserve. Is that right? Well, what is mercy? Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Excuse me for a minute. Case in point. Where is Lot? He's in a wicked place. Because he started looking, started leaning, started living, and started lingering there. We've already dealt with that. Mm -hmm. Does Lot deserve to be judged with those wicked people? Yes, the answer is yes. Absolutely he does. He deserves God to kill him. You know why? Because he got to the place where he's nothing but a reproach. He's got to the place he don't have a good testimony. He's lost his influence. He has no credibility. And he absolutely has no value. He, in other words, he has lost his savor. Hey, it, salt is good. But if the salt have lost its savor, it is good for nothing. Not even for the dunghill. That's what Luke said. I believe it was Luke that said that. Jesus said over here in Matthew, near the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, it's good for nothing. But to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Do you understand what I say when I say that Lot lost his savor? Therefore, he absolutely deserved to be killed with that judgment of God. Amen. And can I just go further? If I myself personally or you get to the place in your life 
Well, you don't bring glory to God anymore. And you start dabbling around with a bunch of sinners and start living contrary to the book. You're saved. You're not going to lose your salvation. But you deserve the judgment that falls on them. And just as much as I do. That's a fact. But mercy. Oh yeah, that's what we're talking about. Mercy says, I'm going to withhold something that you need. You deserve judgment. But I withhold mercy. What God's withholding mercy, it begins when He says, get out of here unless you're consumed. You deserve to be consumed, but we're going to get you out of here. I'm talking about the mercy. Verse, 7, verse 16 says, I'm walking through this quickly. And while he lingered, he's still lingering. He, he doubly deserves to die right here. Come on. They told him they're about to destroy it. He's lingering around. What are you doing now, Lot? Get out. But he's hanging around because he's not willing to part with all his new friends and his family and his fellowship. While he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand. You know what that was? Excuse me. I'll tell you what it is. It says this. They laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And here's why. The Lord being, what's the word? Merciful. The reason this happened is the mercy of God. Verse number 17. He said, and it came to pass when they brought them for the broad, he said, escape for thy life, lest thou be consumed. And here's mercy. You deserve to die. You deserve it. You deserve to be consumed. But get out of here. We're giving you a chance. We're showing mercy. Amen. Verse number 19. Amen. Verse 19. Here's Lot recognizing the mercy of God. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified, what's it say? Thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto who? Me. In saving my life. Excuse me. There's so much that I'm not even going to get to deal with. But he's showing the mercy, amen, right there in verse 21. He said unto me, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing, and I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. That's the mercy of God again coming through the angels. He's showing mercy. Verse number 29. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities that he remembered Abraham and he sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Why? Because of mercy. Amen. Verse number 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. This is after the fact he should have already been killed. Amen. He wasn't supposed to go to Zoar. That's a whole other man. I may have to come back and preach another message in between the cornholes and roll them all up because we're missing a whole lot of preaching there. But the bottom line is Lot never was supposed to be in Zoar. Amen. Even in judgment he wasn't supposed to go to Zoar. But God had a little mercy and let him go ahead and he eventually ended up in the place where God wanted him in the mountain. Yeah. I'm saying the beginning of a merciful judgment because while this judgment was awful, while it was determined by sovereignty, hey man, while it was the destruction of Sodom and it was displayed in the smoke, it provided deliverance for some who was delivered primarily Lot and his wife. It provided deliverance. Let me back up. It provided deliverance for his sons-in-law and, their and his daughters. Mm -hmm. They just didn't want it. Right. God is not going to force himself on people that don't want him. And, the, and by the way, oh, there's a, I, I really probably need to go back and preach a whole other message there because the truth of the matter is when you come to God's terms, you have to come His way. You don't get to negotiate when and how and where. You have to do it His way or you don't get it at all. God brought them a message of deliverance, hey man, through Lot. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have none of it because they couldn't get past the messenger and get the message at hand. And because of that, they died. They were damned to the charred walls of hell and they're there this morning because they did not accept the deliverance provided. Jesus came to Calvary. He died. He provided a way of escape. He provided deliverance. And you and I are not saved just because He died on the cross. We're saved because we accepted the finished work on Calvary. We have embraced the deliverance He has offered. The gift has to be received. It provided deliverance for some. Let me just say, it is only by the sweet mercy of God that we, as His children this morning, this is the whole message and I'll be done. It's only by the sweet mercy of God that we are not consumed by the severe wrath of God. Amen. Get that statement in your mind. The statement came to my mind when I was studying this the other day. Here's the fact, and I'll give you Scripture for it. It is only by the sweet mercy of God that we are not consumed by the severe judgment of God. 
The Bible says in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse number 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. He is compassionate towards His own. Can I tell you something? God is compassionate towards those that even reject Him. He's so compassionate, Brother James, that He, fully being sovereign, knows they're going to reject Him, and yet He gives them a free will and a choice of mind to make that even in their rejection, He shows compassion to give them an opportunity to change their mind. I'm talking about it is only of His mercies. We're not consumed. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse number 9, For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that leave them captive. That's the judgment of God. You go read all of them and all of Second Chronicles. There, God's bringing judgment upon the people of God. They're going to be taken captive by Babylon. Y'all understand all that? They're going to be taken captive. But even in their captivity, that's the judgment of God. Go ahead and read your Bible. You know that's the case. The captivity is the judgment of God. Through a wicked nation, God judges His people. He said, even God's going to show compassion. If you'll turn to God, even in God's judgment, because the reason He's judging them, the re and I ain't got time to go preach all that, but the reason God is judging them is because they have turned away from Him and He has not changed. He said, if you'll turn back to Me, He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will fi you'll find some compassion and your children will find some compassion. Amen before them that lead them captive so they shall come again into this land. That The compassion of God is I'll restore you eventually if you'll learn to turn to me even in judgment. Amen. For the Lord your God, and here's why, this is the ways of God. This is important. For the Lord your God is gracious and full. Oh, the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. That's who God is. And He will not turn away His face from you if, there's the key, if you return unto Him. I believe with all my heart. So I, Jesus said so. So I'm on solid ground. I've already alluded to that when He was rebuking court. He said He upbraided them. I mean, I wish I had time to preach all that. He upbraided them and I mean, rebuked the fire. And He said, whoa, what do you... When Jesus says, whoa, what do you... That's dangerous ground, friend. He said, he said, if the works that have been done here had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, what did He say? They would have repented. You know what that means? They would have turned back to God. Repented? Yeah, they would, have, they, they would have recognized that He is God and they would have turned back. That's what He's saying here. Turn back. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 31, Nevertheless, for thy, listen to this, Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, Thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for Thou art a gracious and a merciful God. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, And therefore will the Lord wait. What's He going to wait for? He's waiting for you to return. He's waiting for you to repent. Therefore will the Lord wait, because He's about to judge them too. Isaiah is very clear. He said that He may, why does He wait? That He may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. He is a God of judgment. We're preaching that this morning right there. God is a God of judgment. God will always judge sin. God hates sin. He hated their sin. He hates your sin. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Jeremiah chapter 3. Oh my. First three chapters of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is pronouncing judgment against the people of God because of their sin. Are you all listening? Their sin. What did they do? They walked after the men of God, walked after that which profited not. They walked after some things that weren't beneficial. Amen. Because when leadership starts following after that which is not God, guess where the people go? And God, God sends a messenger by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said, and this is what God said. Go and proclaim these words. The first three chapters and verse all the way to verse 11, there's some words of God to the people because they won't repent. He said, go and proclaim these words to the north and say, Return! Thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. Repent. Return! You're backsliding. You're not right with God. And I will not cause mine anger. What's his anger? His judgment. 
I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. The only thing that keeps God's anger from being held on to and exercised in wrath and judgment is when people are unrepentant about their sin. Or they try to excuse why they live in the sin that they do. The Bible says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant from his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever. Why does God not continue to stay angry? There's only one thing that keeps him from being angry. And we've read it over and over and over. What causes God to show mercy? What causes it when people turn, when they recognize they're, they're wrong and God's right? He said, He will not retain His anger forever because, here's why, He, listen to this word, He delighteth in mercy. Mm. Micah 7, 18. <clears throat> The Bible says in John 3, 16, we know verse 16, but in verse 16 and 17 it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. What was that? A picture of His judgment. Mm. Calvary's. Come on, I've already dealt with this this morning. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. That believing in Him is accepting His payment. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now get this. Now here's the point. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Though there was judgment manifested through Calvary on the Son of God, namely Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus came to die. But He came to seek and to save that which was lost. His death on Calvary is, a, is absolutely the picture of God's full wrath and judgment. So much wrath, the Bible says that God could not, the Father could not look upon the Son. And Jesus said, My God, my God, uh, Eli, Eli, Mastabat, Lathenai, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou, what's the word, forsaken me? God hates sin so much. Though Jesus was sinless and perfect, because your sin and my sin was upon him, the sins of the whole world, the heavenly Holy Father, because he was wrathful and hated sin so much, he couldn't even look on him. He said it, Jesus didn't come to send everybody to hell. He didn't come to condemn the world. Can I say this without hurting the scripture? The fire and brimstone. Judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah did not fall to condemn the whole rest of humanity. That's not why these things are written in the Scripture. He said, He sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Can I? If you go further into the chapter, you know what you'll see? But they're condemned already. And this is the condemnation. Here's their condemnation. That men love darkness rather than light. Because it's, but light has come to the world. Jesus came as the light to draw men unto Himself. He said, if I be lifted up, that's talking about Calvary. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto Me. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Because of the judgment of God being poured out upon the perfect Son of God in a manifestation of God's disdain and detesting of sin. He allowed that to be the opportunity for us to come to Him. He said, and here's, he, he sent not a son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. But, the world, but they are condemned already. They're already condemned. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Sodom and Gomorrah was a dark place. And the reason that they were condemned, God sent these angels. I really believe this. It's a picture. It's a picture. That's why we're going forward from the beginning. We need to see the ways of God. If nothing else, it ought to help you to know how God deals with sin, but how God shows mercy and judgment. God does not delight in sending anybody to hell. God, you ever heard somebody say, why does a perfect God let people go to hell? He allows them. He never sends anybody to hell. People send themselves to hell by rejecting that light that has come into the world. They send themselves to hell by rejecting the truth of the Word of God. Amen and amen. But God allowed these angels to come into Sodom and Gomorrah to extend one thing, and that was mercy. And they would have none of it. Therefore the judgment and the wrath of God fell unadulterated, undefiled, unpure. I mean just... But all through the Scriptures you'll find that God is a God. He 
does not delight in judgment. Can I say this? You've heard me say this as a pastor. You've heard me say it as a preacher. My family's heard it most of my adult Christian life. You've heard me talk about people that won't get right with God. Now, I prayed for God to break them, put their head through a windshield specifically, things like that, wrecks. Whatever your case is, you say, that's mean. Mm, it's not. Because I don't delight in the pain. Listen to me, church. I don't delight in the pain that they go through. God does not delight in the pain that they go through. But what He delights in is that that's what it takes to bring them to the place where they will accept the mercy of God. That's what He delights in, to bring them back to Himself. That's what brings delight to the preacher. It's not watching people suffer. They're already suffering. Do you understand? When somebody goes crossways with the man of God and they get crossed with the Bible and they get crossed with God, they're already condemned. They're already, I mean, they may not lose their salvation. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about somebody that knows God, that walks with God, at one point in time or another got saved by the grace of God and they have decided to get crossed with God and the man of God and the people of God and the man of God says, I want God to break every bone in their body if that's what. Now, therefore, you miss it sometimes. Because the condition is, if that will bring them back. And when they come back, you know what we do? We don't kick them. They've already been kicked. And we extend mercy. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. God, listen to me, delights in mercy. He delights in mercy. Even in the worst of His judgment. He doesn't destroy people because He enjoys destroying people. But if you think that that is a reason for us to think that God won't destroy people, then you know nothing of God. If you think that God's mercy will supersede His holiness, you know nothing of the attributes of God. Because God is a merciful God. We've read, I read you several verses, and I didn't give you everything. I didn't want to be here until 2 o'clock this afternoon. But I'm telling you, I gave you enough Bible. You ought to know your Bible anyways. And I gave you enough Bible to remind you that God is a God from Genesis to Revelation all through the book who delights in extending mercy. But His mercy comes at a condition. You're going to have to repent. You're going to have to recognize the judgment that's coming. You deserve it. You know what that is? It's saying, God, you're right and I'm wrong. My sin is not okay. No matter how big or small I think it is, my sin is an offense against God. David's greatest day was not that he had recognized his sin, not that he recognized the consequences of his sin. King David, are y'all listening to me? The greatest day in King David's life was when he made this statement, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Now, wait a minute. Was other people involved in David's sin? Was other people involved in his sin? Yes. Did he sin against other people? Yes. But he recognized that wasn't the worst of it. The very absolute sin among sin among all sins, and David recognized it, was that I have sinned against a holy God. And when you and I get to that place, that's when God goes and shows the extra mercy. Because as long as you're at the place where you're comparing yourself to somebody else or you think you don't deserve it or you deserve better than that or, well, I've lived this way my whole life. I'll have to live there. You don't ever have. Hey, listen, I don't care if you live to be 100 years old. You are not entitled to one blessed thing. And neither am I. Don't ever get to the place where you think you're entitled to anything. Don't ever get to the place, son. I know you're not. I'm just warning. Don't ever get to the place where you think, well, my daddy's a pastor. I'm entitled to... Mm -mm. You're not entitled to squat. Mama, you're married to a preacher. That doesn't give you any sense of entitlement. I'm a pastor. That doesn't give me any sense of entitlement to excuse my sin either. Are you listening to me? God, right here in this picture, I can't see a clearer picture. There, Mackenzie, make your way to the piano. I am telling you, church, you say, what more? Aren't you, let me tell you what I love about expository Bible preaching. You don't have to go looking for the message. It's right there in the text. And you know what I love about God? Here we are in Genesis chapter 19. This is now the second time in a huge way that we see God manifest His character. But it is the third time. The first time was in the Garden of Eden. Amen. And then we saw the tower. Oh, well, I can start walking through. The three great big times so far. We saw the Garden of Eden bloodshed. We saw the flood. 
water. Listen to me. I don't know. Three things right here. You know what they are? The three elements that you will find all in the New Testament. Starts with blood. Then there's water. Then what's next? Fire. A picture of God the Father. The fire. A picture of God the Son. The blood. And a picture of God the Holy Ghost. The water. Three things that you've seen the mercy of God extended here on Throughout the beginning of the Old Testament, here we are going forward from the beginning. Now we see the picture of the ultimate fire, the wrath of God. But yet in that fiery indignation, that fiery judgment, you see the sweet spirit of God extending mercy. So much so that Lot and his two daughters, and his wife had a chance, but she still wouldn't follow through. Lot, how many people? How many people just came out of there? Three. Three people came out of the judgment of God. Do you know why? Because God extended mercy in the midst of judgment. God extended mercy. So much so, not one verse will you read anywhere where Lot said, I don't understand why God's judging Solomon. It's not there. No. You hear me? It's not there. Nowhere do you see Lot questioning the mercy of God. In fact, Lot, I read it. He said, Thou hast manifest thy mercy towards me in what? Saving my life. Now, I don't know what God's going to do in your life. I don't know what God's going to do in my life. But I'm going to tell you right now if you have sin in your life of any kind, any shape, any size, God's calling your attention this morning saying, you know what you better do? You better quit making excuses for it. You better quit comparing it to everybody else. You better get before me and realize I hate sin. And ultimately, because of who I am, I will judge your sin. You're saved by the grace of God. You'll never lose your salvation. You hear me? But God, will, the fellowship will be broke. You'll lose a sweet communion with God. And ultimately, God will judge you. He'll chastise you. And if you won't get right then, He'll take your life. He will kill you. Because there is a sin unto death. That's to a child of God. It won't get right. And that's why Paul in the book of Hebrews said, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's not to a lost man. That's to save people that won't deal with their sin. And God delights. By the way, just I'm trying to shut her down here. The very verses that we just read and quoted, you know what they are? Those verses are just another extension of the mercy of God while He's about to pour out His judgment. We'll stand together Well, my friends, we've just heard a message from the pulpit of Harvest Baptist Church. I pray that it was a help and a blessing to your life. This is no doubt a place where God's Word changes lives. If God's Word was a blessing or a help to your life today, we'd like to hear from you. Please write to us at Harvest Baptist Church, P.O. Box 110, Allen, Texas 75013. Again, is P.O. Box 110, Allen, Texas 75013. May God richly bless you and the preaching of His Word. Have a wonderful day.